Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Um, yeah, it's so good to be with you all to celebrate this this Easter Sunday. Um, something uh, something struck me while I was while I was picking songs and getting prepared for this morning, and that is that um, that uh, as much as everything going on in this world, you know, is is such a huge deal. Uh, this global pandemic and and everything that everyone's going through right now what we're celebrating uh this morning and and this past week is just so much bigger than than anything that's going on around us so we really do have a reason to celebrate here so um yeah i i believe dave stubbs it will have the list of songs in the comments section he told me so if you look in the comments section however that works you should see the, the songs that were gonna sing today. Um, so yeah, just uh, join with me. <clears throat>
Amen. Well, thank you for joining me and stay tuned for Pastor Ann. So many stories. Thank you. Can you he is risen, and Antoine's going to join me. You're going to say, He is risen indeed. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful morning. Welcome to Resurrection Morning. This is the day that we celebrate all of eternity changed on this day. He died on the Friday, and as the expression was, Friday's here, but Sunday's coming. We're at Sunday. Hug somebody. Hug Amen. somebody in your family. Celebrate. Happy he Easter. is risen. Happy Easter to you all this morning. We're going to go right into communion this morning and just celebrate. So let's just have a moment of prayer together. Father, we thank you that this day is the day that we celebrate. This, <laughs> excuse me, this is the day when they went to find the body. The women went to anoint the body and put the spices on it. And much to their shock and surprise, he wasn't there. He is risen. And so we thank you that we get to celebrate that this morning. Lord, help it to be fresh in our hearts this morning. Help it to be something that, that's a fresh revelation again this morning to us. He's not here. He's risen. And he's Amen. almighty God and king. And so as we celebrate communion as a church family this morning, we ask Holy Spirit that you will just minister to us as we minister to you with all of the joy, all of the thankfulness, all of the love that we have stored in our hearts. He is risen. This is a good day. Our living Savior is in control. Our living Savior is on the throne. And we give you praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Thank you. My congregation of one is a great blessing here. I'm sorry, I'm just watching our congregation. We're up to about 25 now, so people are still switching over for a moment to, to catch us on the on this broadcast. Okay, well that's good. I hope they all switch. And uh, while we're waiting for people to catch up with us this morning, let me just say this. We are starting a new series next week called Help! We're Quarantined. Pastor Trevor is going to be preaching next Sunday. No, I just did that for a joke, Pastor Trevor. I'm sorry. I just wanted to get you. But we are starting a new series called Help. I'm quarantined. We're quarantined. And we're going to do a series on family life, seeing as we're all together as families and not many places to go. So we hope that you'll join us. We're excited to start that series. And uh, we're also going to say to you this afternoon, we want you to start flooding Facebook with your happy Easter message from all of us. So happy Easter to everybody. Well, as people are joining us, we're going to have communion anyway. I'm reading from Luke chapter 22. And this was the account of Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples. And uh, he, when the hour came, Luke 22, verse 14, it says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And he went on to talk about how Judas would betray him. I think about that Last Supper. The disciples had been told so many times by Jesus that he, in fact, was going to go to Jerusalem. He, in fact, was going to sacrifice his life, but he would rise again. And as he's taking that bread and as he's taking that cup, he's saying, listen, my broken body on that cross and the blood that I shed is what is going to bring you right relationship with my Father. It's going to bring you into the fullness of relationship. I'm going to take the cost of your sin. I'm going to take the cost of your distancing yourself from me. And I'm going to bring you into all that I am. And I think that Last Supper must have been something. Before he said, one of you who's going to betray me is sitting here. There, you know, the picture of them you know, reclining at the table. You know, the, the, the good old boys with their master having a wonderful meal. And yet he imparts to them it's an incredible truth. Isaiah says that by those stripes that he received on his back, we receive our healing. I've been the recipient of physical healing many times through prayer. 
And Anton as well has received physical healing. But more than that, we receive spiritual healing. We receive wholeness as our sins are covered and we are forgiven. So this morning for communion, if you have your crackers or your bread, whatever it is you have and your juice ready, let's take the cracker or the bread together. I have Mr. Donker serving me this morning very carefully. There we go. And this morning, if you are enjoying communion with us, I'd like to just close my eyes for a minute with you and say, Lord Jesus, we thank you that those many thousands of years ago you went to the cross. And your body was broken in order for us to receive our salvation. By your stripes we are healed. This morning on this resurrection morning, mm -hmm. we pray together that for every person having communion at this moment, they will receive a new sense of resurrection life. I pray for those who need healing. Father, if we were physically in our church building, we would have an altar call and we would lay hands on them and anoint them with oil. And if you're with your family or with friends this morning in the same room, just lay hands on each other if you need that physical touch. I pray for those who need physical healing, emotional healing. Father, I pray for those who may be suffering mentally and need mental healing. In the name of Jesus, as we eat this bread in remembrance of you, Bring that fullness of healing, we pray. For those, Lord Jesus, who have suffered loss this year, I pray that they will receive healing comfort this morning. Yes. That you will touch them this morning, Lord Jesus, and bring the fullness of resurrected life to their spirits. Let's eat this bread now, knowing that our Savior died for our healing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And after he had taken that bread, he gave them the cup. Honey, if we can have that cup. And he said, this is my blood shed for you. It wasn't actual blood, but let me read it to you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant is that salvation comes through the cross. Salvation comes through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. It's not through following the law. It's not through sacrificing uh, goats and lambs. Salvation comes through that one sacrifice of Jesus. And because of that, we have eternal life. Let's drink this in remembrance of that new covenant. Let's drink this with a joyful heart. Because he shed his blood, because he died, because he rose again, we have eternity in eternity with Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's drink Thank together. You. And now, Father, we just thank you and bless you. Hallelujah. If I had a guitar, I'd sing for you, but I don't. And so we just thank you, Lord Jesus. Receive that <laughs> resurrected life. Even now, in Jesus' name, receive yes. that resurrected life. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Lord you. Jesus. Receive. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just receive that resurrected life right where you are. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a little video we want to play for you this morning.
morning he is risen. This is the morning that we've been waiting for. He is risen. This is the day that stunned the disciples and the early believers. This is the day they hoped for. This is the day they were they, they, they wanted to happen. They were dreaming about it, but they were almost too afraid to dream about it. Jesus had, been di had died, uh, and he'd been buried. He was in the tomb. And they were hiding for fear of the Jews and hiding for fear of the Romans. And, and all of a sudden, on the third day, the women went to the tomb, as I said earlier, and he wasn't there. And the revelation began to come. He is risen. This was the day that was going to blow their mind. Have you ever been in a situation where you're so excited you can hardly believe it? You know it's true, but you can't believe it? I think, ladies, one of the things that we can think back to is that day when our husbands asked us to marry them. We, you, know, you know, it's true. You've got that beautiful new ring on your finger. But, it, like, I, I, I can't believe it. We're engaged. I mean, for you guys, maybe it's the day when you get that sports car that you've always been dreaming about. It's too good to be true. That's what Resurrection Sunday was for the disciples. It was too good to be true. This morning we were sent videos from our, our kids with our little grandsons, and our little three-and-a-half-year-old was hilarious. They had hidden chocolate Easter eggs all around the living room, and he kept saying, he hided them everywhere. He hided them everywhere. It, it, I, all of a sudden, all morning, I've been singing, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, because our little grandson was, Daddy, he hideth them everywhere. And our little guys in the States, our little two-year-old, was introduced to his first Easter egg hunt. And you can see on their faces, it's unbelievable. It's too good to be true. That's what the disciples were going through that day. This was the biggest death of a dream in a weekend that anyone could ever imagine when he died. And then on Sunday morning, it was the biggest resurrection of a dream that anybody could ever imagine. But when he died on that Friday, I can imagine being one of the disciples, or Mary, his mother, or, or Mary Magdalene, or I try to put myself in those stories. I think, what if I was there? What if I was there at the time of Jesus? Would I have been a believer, or would I have been a Pharisee? Have you ever asked yourself that? Would, would I have followed him with all of my heart? Or, or would I have been one of the rulers saying, he's, he's, he's a cult leader, he's, 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 he's an issue, he's a problem? I hope, I pray, I would have been one of the ones that would have followed him. But of those that followed him and of the disciples, on that, on that terrible day when he was crucified, they're standing at the cross and he's up there and they're going, what's happening? This miracle worker, this Jesus who could read your mind and know your thoughts, this one who had compassion on the poor and the suffering, this one who was, was just love personified, yet he wasn't afraid to take on the hypocritical leaders. This Jesus who promised eternal life was dead. He's on the cross. They did it. They executed him. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't believe it. How could it be possible? And the charade of trials that he had been put through was unbelievable. There were six trials in all. He had been taken to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, and there were false witnesses, and they took him off to, to, uh, uh, to Pilate, and the trial of Pilate was just something to behold. Pilate took Jesus into his, into his home, so to speak, and he said to him, look, are you the king of the Jews? Because that is the, the um, accusation the Jews were making. They needs to die. He says king is a threat to Caesar. That's how they, they accuse Jesus. Pilate said to him, are you a king? Jesus said nothing. So after some time, he went out to them and he said, look, I don't find any fault in this guy. What's your issue? And they kept yelling, crucify him, crucify him. So he takes him back in. And he has Jesus flogged, and the soldiers put a crown of thorns on his head, and they dress him in a purple robe. Because Pilate senses this is somebody different. Now, in a
And Pilate lets it rip. He just says to them, here is your king. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, here is your king. Pilate said to the Jews, here is your king. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. And Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And they said, we have no king but Caesar. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. That was it. That was the end. I relate to Mary as a mother. I, I, I tell you what, I can't think of that happening to me and if my sons or I'd be broken down and sobbing, just thinking about it. But can you relate to any of the disciples there? That was it. This is it. It's over. See, we have times of great excitement in our lives and times when we go, this is too good. I, I can't believe this. I can't put it in the words. And then we have times of great disappointment in our lives. And then we have times of great confusion in our lives. And the confusion there was terrible. There are times when we get bad news and, and, and we, can't, we can't comprehend it. We, you, you, this can't be true. This can't be happening. There, there, there are times when we get an, unexpected news or something happens to us. We, this, this can't be happening. No, 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 no. This is not happening. I, I can't receive this. I can't deal with this. And that's what was happening on that day. This can't be happening. Just a few days ago, we were coming into Jerusalem with them and they were shouting, Hosanna to the king. And now, well, I, I can't do this. I can't believe this. But you see, all of this was the plan of Almighty God to bring you and I into relationship with him. Do you know, I talk to you about looking at the big picture. Because when we look at the big picture, we understand that God's ways are bigger than our ways. God's ways are bigger than our thoughts. And what you and I can't see today, God sees all the way through to eternity. And so, it was over on Good Friday. And the disciples thought they had failed. I enjoyed the Good Friday service with Northgate. I hope you did. On behalf of uh, Comox Pentecostal, I sent a note to Pastor Evan and to the Northgate team just to thank them for having us in their service. But oh my goodness, that was amazing. And Pastor Evan preached us such a wonderful sermon. And the essence of his sermon around Peter and Jesus was this. Peter was trying to keep Jesus from taking any offense. But the deal was that Jesus actually was going to the cross to cover Peter's offense. Isn't that the most beautiful thing? We try to keep Jesus from being offended, but Jesus went to the cross to cover our offense that we already have. Well, let's look at John 20, verses 1 to 9. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now they've been, you know, Friday, Saturday, this was now Sunday morning in, in terms of how we'll call the days. And they've been hiding and they've been licking their wounds, so to speak. He's dead. Now what? He's dead. But early that Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and she said, they have taken, they've taken my notes. Where did they go? <laughs> if you touch your iPad the wrong way, you guys, you're going to lose your notes. Hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. I'm going to find it. She said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple, who's John, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place. And this thing is giving me real problems this morning. So you guys pray for my iPad. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Now this is really interesting. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had risen from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. It's so interesting that they had heard from Jesus. He had 
say in past days, you will destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. You know, the Apostle Paul calls your body the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's the same thing. Jesus was saying, you destroy this earthly temple, I'll raise it again in three days. And here are Peter and John in the tomb. And here's the linen, the burial cloth lying there, the linen lying there. And he's not there. And they go, oh my goodness, where is he? They still did not understand that he had been risen from the tomb. Let me tell you something. God's timing is perfect in our lives. God's timing is perfect in your life. God's timing is perfect in my life. And there will be times when he will reveal to you what he needs you to know only at the time that you need it. And this is where faith comes into play for all of us who are living a resurrected life, which is what we're doing today. By faith, we believe. There are things in your life. Listen, I'm speaking to you right now from the Lord. There are some of you this morning, there are things in your life you don't understand, and you cry out to God, and you want the Holy Spirit to change it. Why, Lord, why? Hold on. God's revelation, God's Spirit will make it clear to you at the right time. Don't give up. When my younger brother died 30 years ago, I sorrowed for a year, a good year. Really, when I look back, I went into a depression. I couldn't put it together. I, I couldn't put it together that we had given God our lives, that our whole family, I, we had served God. We'd given things up for the church. <laughs> Just, I couldn't put it together. And a year later, I was sitting in my chair in the living room where God took me to, I believe it's Isaiah 57, the righteous perish and no one questions why. The Lord takes them to save them from future troubles. Do you know that was the answer that broke the depression? That was the answer that released my spirit that allowed me to let my brother go. Now God didn't reveal it to me for a whole year because there were things in my spirit and things in my heart as a 31-year-old woman and mother of three and wife that I needed to deal with. But at the right time, Holy Spirit said, I'm lifting that grief this morning. I've taken your brother to preserve him from future troubles. And you see, you understand that the Spirit of God knows when you need revelation, and they weren't ready for it at the tomb. We often read scripture, we don't really get it, we don't really take it to heart, but when you read scripture, begin to receive it and understand that the Spirit of God is going to reveal this to you. Here's the thing, after three years of being together with Jesus, those disciples are now in shock for the second time in as many days. They're in terrible shock on, on the day of the crucifixion, it's over, he's dead. And now they're in shock again. Oh my gosh, the body's gone. Where is he? <laughs> they were looking for a conquering hero. Still. And they hadn't realized that the conquering hero they were looking for that weekend had actually become the sacrificial lamb. Our conquering hero is a sacrificial lamb. Let me take you back in history. Remember the departure of the Israelites from Egypt? What did God tell them to do? Exodus 12, verses 1 to 3. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Now, they've been told that they're going to leave Egypt. They've been told that God is going to deliver them. They don't know what this is going to look like, but they're just following orders right now. And so Aaron and Moses from the Lord say, listen, the head of every household, go out, get a lamb, make sure it's perfect, and, and, then, and then we'll give you more instructions. This was the beginning of their deliverance. This was the time they were longed for, and suddenly it was here. Do you ever find that you pray for things for years, and suddenly, suddenly, Angela and I, for years, wanted to live in a home that would overlook water. We're water people, and we all know that by now. And, and we had looked on the island for, I don't know, three, maybe five years, just kind of looked, and suddenly, the home that we're in came up, and within a week, we had bought it, and we knew it was there. Right? We had prayed, we had sought the Lord, not, not, I can't even say seriously, but we just said to the Lord, hey, this is a desire, if it's of you, and suddenly, well, here we are, the Egyptians, for years, had cried out to to, 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 to the Lord, to their God. Oh, deliver us. And suddenly, but they were to get a lamb. I asked 
professor, the Egyptians were led, pardon me, they were led by the Pharaoh who wasn't overly inclined to let the Israelites go. And there was an interesting scripture uh, back in Exodus that I never really understood. It said Pharaoh wouldn't let the Israelites go because God had hardened his heart. Do you know what? That bothered me. I have to be honest. I thought, God, if Pharaoh had a soft heart to you, why would you pardon it? Now, I, I, listen, I don't know that Pharaoh did have a soft heart. Please don't hear me wrong. But I asked a professor once who shed some light on it, and he said this. He said, we all have a choice to submit to God, but every time God allowed Sarah, Pharaoh to choose his way, he rejected it. And see, here's the thing. If people reject God long enough, hard enough, long enough, God just finally says, okay, it's your choice, and he removes his hands. See, and Pharaoh had rejected God so far, so hard, that God just said, your choice. And he removed his hands from him, so to speak. Pharaoh, in that day and in that culture, considered himself a god. So God said, fine, your choice. God removed his hands. Well, you remember the Egyptians had suffered various plagues from the Lord, and the worst one was about to take place. And this is what God told the Israelites to do. They were to slaughter the lamb that they had picked at a set time. And then Exodus 12 tells us this. They are to take some of the blood of the lamb that they'd slaughtered and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. On that same night, God says, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Hey, Pharaoh, I got news for you. You're not God. I am. The blood, God says to the Israelites, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. Now listen, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a picture of the cross. It was a picture of the cross. It was a picture of sin and God's sacrifice and the blood that would be shed to redeem you and I. See, Leviticus 17 says this, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. It is the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There's no forgiveness. There's no covering of sins. And so you see, the disciples on that fateful day when Jesus was crucified, they had seen the bloodshed, they had seen Jesus' body taken off the cross and put in a tomb, they had seen the sacrificial lamb give up his life. And now, they were going to see the risen Christ. Three things that I want you to take away from this morning. They were to have their greatest crisis turned into their greatest triumph. They were to have the greatest fears turned into the greatest praise. And they were to have their greatest sorrow turned into their greatest joy. Their greatest crisis on the Friday was to become their greatest triumph on the Sunday. Their greatest fear was to turn into their greatest praise. And their greatest sorrow was going to turn into their greatest joy. Their king was the sacrificial lamb. They sang it at Northgate on Friday. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Isaiah says in his first chapter, Come, now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as red as scarlet, I will wash them white as snow. How do you take red blood and make it white? I, you know, I worked for a company when I was in my early 20s. It was a medical company, and somehow in that company, they took red blood and they made it green. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me what it was all about. I just remember it was a really fun day when we celebrated when we had green blood that day in our, in our labs in that country. But Jesus took his own blood and shed it and took our sinful crimson ugh, and washed us white as snow. You know, I'm wearing white today because it's just a cooler top, and I don't know where it is in Quahog. It's been in Ladies Night. It's nice and warm. But I'm wearing white today to celebrate. He washed us white as snow. In John chapter 20, Jesus records two beautiful moments. The first one, he revealed himself to Mary Magdalene. Now, she's the woman who had been delivered of seven spirits, and she was a follower of Christ. 
And he's about to reveal himself to her as a sacrificial lamb and also her king. And look at how beautiful he was with her. In, in um, Luke chapter 20, verse 15, he, she, she, she finds him and she's crying and she's weeping and, and she's so terribly upset. She's still in sorrow mode from Friday. And he says to her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking she was, he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get him. And Jesus simply said to her, Mary. <sighs> Revelation. Mary. She grabbed his ankles. He said, no, 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 don't touch me. Don't, I, Luke, don't touch me yet. But all of a sudden, her sorrow was lifted. She received at that moment resurrected life. Mary. As a woman, it thrills me that the first one he revealed himself to was a woman. I guess that sounds a little sexist. I hope not. It just kind of does something for my heart. Guys, you are incredibly important and wonderful, and we love you, and he's about to reveal himself to you, but it just, is, it just shows to me the tenderness of who he is. This sacrificial lamb, Mary. And then he goes on in John chapter 20, and he reveals himself to his disciples on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. See, until he revealed to Mary that he was risen, they didn't know. Where have they taken him? What have they done with him? Here's the bigger question. What are they going to do with me? And that's the thing about sin, and that's the thing about the enemy. What's he going to do with me? There are so many in our world today that are in sin, and they're lost and without Jesus, and we love them because Jesus died for them. I've been growing tomato plants from little seedlings, and I had about 10 yesterday that were grown to a nice height. Now, I'm not crafty. I'm not artistic that way. I think some of you are very good with crafts. But we went out and got some foil and some ribbon, and, and I wrapped each little tomato plant up, and we wrote a little note, and we delivered them to our neighbors. We wished them a happy Easter and on and on and on. And they were just so blessed and so thrilled. Now, I didn't preach salvation to them in that little note. But to tell you what, Anton and I prayed over those little tomato plants and over those notes. And we're praying still. The woman talked about Easter being a season, a new life, and that we prayed that God would bless them this Easter season. We just wanted the love of Jesus to touch them in a small way. Because our concern for our neighbors is what are the plans of the enemy for them? Hmm? And it's like that fear that the disciples have. The Romans have killed our Savior. What are they going to do for us? <coughs> but when Jesus revealed to himself, he came and stood among them, and here's what he said. Peace be with you. See, if you see this resurrected morning, peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Crisis turned to triumph. Fear turned to praise. Sorrow turned to joy. See, this is the message of the resurrection. Our biggest crisis is our sin. That's the biggest crisis in our life. What is sin? Missing the mark. Separation from God. We've been separated from God, and, and we were born that way. But we come to a point in our lives where we reach this crisis. Oh, I'm separated from God. I'm in sin. I need a Savior. It's a, it, it's, it's, it's a crisis moment. It's a fear moment. It's a sorrow moment. What am I going to do? I'm separated from God. And God comes along and says, peace be with you. He shows us his hands and he shows us his side. And suddenly our crisis becomes a triumph as we surrender our lives to this risen Savior. You see, the days of Jesus were not unlike our own. People suffered. People were abused. People did the abusing. People lost relationships. People battled against life's strangling poverty. People took the lives of others. People took their own lives. There's nothing new under the sun. But on that resurrection morning, come on, come on, on that resurrection morning, the risen lamb 
rose from the dead and he brought the reality of sin defeated, relationships restored, he brought purpose into life, he brought eternity into view, he brought revelation, we are not hopeless, we are a people of a resurrected God, somebody say hallelujah. Amen, amen. Amen. That's the resurrected story. That's what it's all about. We have hope, we have eternity, we have joy this morning in a resurrected Savior. He triumphed over hell and sin. He triumphed over our hopelessness. He triumphed over every obstacle that we face. And even if we don't appear to win here, we win. I read the end of the book, as people say. Oh my goodness. I could preach forever on this. I could go round and round. Are you getting it this morning? Are you receiving it this morning? Peace be to you. You are a resurrected people living a resurrected life. So I'm wondering this morning if you have the miracle of Easter fresh in your spirit. You may be watching this morning and you said, Ann, this is exciting. I'd actually like a piece of that. But I've never got this resurrected life. I understand that if I haven't in a relationship with Jesus, I'm in sin, I'm separated from him, but what do I do to be resurrected and more part of this resurrection story this morning? It's really very simple. If you're in a moment of crisis in your life where you're realizing I'm a sinner, you just pray a prayer like this with me, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner, but you died and you rose again and you said peace to me. So today I confess my sin to you. I ask you to come into my life. Wash me clean from my sin and be my resurrected Lord and King. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you're with somebody, <coughs> please help them. I just prayed that prayer. Let them give you a hug. Let them celebrate. Because you are somebody who's now living a resurrected life. You have hope. You have all of eternity with Jesus. Suddenly, the disciples had revelation. He's alive. I think of the two people walking on the road to Emmaus, Emmaus, and do you remember Jesus joined them? And he began to open up the scriptures to them. There's nothing better than having a good teacher or somebody who knows scripture, and, and they just want to suck it in and suck it in and suck it in. Teach me more, tell me more, tell me more. But they said to him, look, it's getting dark. Come into our home, have dinner with us. And, and he went into their home, and at a moment, he revealed that he was the risen Christ, and he disappeared. And here's what they said after he left. See, they had revelation. Oh, we were walking with Jesus. He's alive. And they said in Luke 24, we're not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. And Luke in his account says, they, they, they packed the bags, gathered up the clothing, and ran back to Jerusalem, back to the disciples. He's alive, he's alive, we were with him, he's alive. Ladies and gentlemen, we are thousands of years removed from that moment. We are thousands of years removed from the cross. But what Jesus did in his death and resurrection is known as the great exchange. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's also known as the great reversal. Adam and Eve took that fruit and sin came into the world. Jesus got on that cross and defeated sin. And for us today, it's a moment of truth. Oh, we don't need the Easter Bunny. Though I love Easter chocolate, the Easter Bunny was good to us. I have a little Easter chocolate today. But we don't need the Easter Bunny. But the reality of our life is he's alive and we are alive every day we have the opportunity of new life. Billy Graham said this, the resurrection gives my life meaning, direction, and the opportunity to start over, no matter what my circumstances. As resurrected people today, whatever you're feeling, whatever you've been through, whatever you're thinking, whatever is weighing you down, give it to that resurrected Christ. Receive that peace be with you from him. Today we have the opportunity to start over. Today we have the opportunity to choose life. Every day can be a day of triumph. 
Today, your fear can turn to faith, your sorrow to joy, and your crisis to praise. Let me close with this. Every day is a resurrection day. Every day is Easter. Every day that you wake up and you're alive and you're breathing, you know that Jesus is alive. You know that God is on the throne. You know that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And you can remember what the angels said to those who looked at the empty tomb. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Comox Pentecostal Church, he's not here in an empty tomb. He's risen. Amen. And have a wonderful day and let me pray for you. Jesus, I thank you that because of the cross and the resurrection, our crisis of sin has been turned into the greatest triumph. Jesus came and delivered us from sin and cleansed us from unrighteousness and is Lord of our life. Our fear, Lord Jesus, is turned into praise. We give you praise today because you are God and King, our resurrected Savior, and our sorrows can be turned into joy. Now, Father, as we enjoy this resurrected life, we think of those around us. Anton and I think of our neighbors, and everyone with me thinks of their neighbors and their family members. And we simply say this on a Resurrection Sunday, Father, we speak life and resurrection to everyone we know. Would you be a life giver? Would many millions come into your kingdom today and every day? The kingdom of God is growing every day. And we speak salvation to family members. We speak salvation to those who are in our neighborhoods and in our relationships. We speak blessing, Lord Jesus. And over Comox Pentecostal Church this morning, I speak peace be with you. He is not here. He is risen. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We will see you next Sunday, Comox, when we start help on quarantine. Have a wonderful Easter Sunday. God bless you. We love you. He is risen. <laughs>